Hey everyone, welcome to CXC 2020, uh, the cyberspace edition. Uh, this is our keynote address. This is our keynote event. And with us is someone that I've known for a very long time. He's one of the most talented uh, cartoonists in the business. He's won many accolades. Uh, the Library of Congress in 2016 named him the ambassador for young people's literature. Uh, and he, uh, that same year, he was awarded a MacArthur Fellowship, which is also known as the MacArthur Genius Grant. Uh, he's best known for American born Chinese, but he has a new book out this year uh, called Dragon Hoops. And I just finished reading it. It's, it's amazing. And we'll talk about that as we get in there. Uh, he's a, one of the most prolific guys working, one of the smartest as well. Uh, everyone, uh, this is Jean Lun Yang. Welcome, Jean. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Jean. There you are. <laughs> How's it start. going? Good. I'm doing good, Jean. I thought you were going to. I have to tell you, this is uh, this is a mind blowing kind of event for me, because uh, years and years ago, I did this multiple times. I went and I lined up to get. Jeff Smith's autograph, and now you and I are having a conversation for a keynote for a comic book festival. This is it's it's really crazy. It's fun. It's fun. I remember. Uh, yeah, I remember uh, like being in San Diego and on the show floor and running into you or running into Scott McCloud or you and Scott McCloud. Uh, yeah, it was a it it we, we go a long ways back. But I was yeah. but as I was preparing for this uh, interview. You've done a, you've done more stuff than I even knew, and it's it's going to be tough to cover. Like I said, you're a very prolific guy. Um, well, so why thanks, don't we get thanks. into it? Uh, there's I have a little image up here. Um, of, it's like a, it's like four or five characters that you've worked on, uh, and they're drawn by you. It includes the uh, the new the new Superman. Is that, did I say that right? That's right. That's yeah. right. And uh, do you have that picture, Jersey? It's like on the slide, the slide rack. One of the first ones. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at it right now. Oh, the, you are. Oh, I don't see it. Oh, okay. Characters. All right, well, again, okay. this is this is our first uh, in 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 our first interview, so I, I don't know exactly how we're going to do all this. Okay, well, great. I'm sorry. Yeah, so we've got. I mean, this is this is uh, just some of the characters that you've worked on, um, but there's some impressive ones in there. Avatar, uh, Superman, the new Superman, and of course uh, you from Dragon Hoops. Um, <laughs> uh, but I thought instead of like going in just in order of your life, I, I would like to talk about Hoops because like I said, I just finished it and I was really taken by this book. I'm not, I'm like you, uh, you present yourself in the book as sort of the quintessential non-sports comics nerd. Well, I was that too. I mean, but I'm a guy. So as I've grown up, uh, you know, I used to watch games with other people and I know how the games work and you can kind of get, you can get worked up when you're watching them. But I was really pulled in in exactly that way with this book. You really conveyed that feeling of getting caught up in the moment, in the sports. And I'm surprised, I would just like to know like, even so, even though you were teaching at uh, about high school and knew the players and stuff, why did you think that would be a good idea for a graphic novel? You know, I, I have to say, I was pretty scared about it when I began. Um, I also uh, teach at Hamlin University. So I'm no longer a high school teacher. I was a high school teacher at Bishop O'Dowd High School for 17 years. And that's the school that is in Dragon Hoops. But I still do teach through uh, Hamlin University in uh, Minneapolis, in, in Minnesota. 
and uh, I teach through their MMA, MFA program, which means most of my students are like adults who are interested in writing graphic novels for young people. And a lot of times they will come up to me and they'll be like, I have three or four different ideas. Which one should I do? And my advice for years has always been do the one that scares you the most. Mm -hmm. So when I had this idea of, of doing a nonfiction graphic novel about basketball, which I knew nothing about, it was a really scary idea and I felt like I had to follow my own advice uh, th that was a that was a big part of it the other part was actually you know Lou Ritchie the 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 coach of that team we became friends and I just found him to be like probably the most fascinating person I know he is just uh he's just a he's lived a crazy life you know uh and and I wanted to do a book about him that's cool. And he, that comes through, that comes through in the book for sure. You kind of like, you like the guy at the end. Um, I was really impressed with the way you, the cartooning choices you made uh, when it came to like showing the action of the game. I mean, there were some, some great slam dunk shots and, and you made sure we knew who the characters were too. We knew which kid, which student this was and when they were doing the slams and when they were getting slams done on them. It was, it, I hope, I hope we're seeing those right now. I don't know. Are we seeing I, some pictures? I, I am. I, I, yeah, I'm seeing that. I'm seeing that. Jersey's okay, going awesome job. Jersey. Okay. Jersey. You're yeah. doing a good job, man. Thank you, buddy. <laughs> Jersey uh, is our uh, interim executive director at uh, CXC for 2020. Uh, and he's, just been doing an amazing job uh, and but he's also behind the scenes i'm letting people at home know yeah uh doing the camera work and stuff like that which i can't see so i'm just going to assume he's doing a fantastic job gene and you just let me know if he sucks okay uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah well well thank you thank you i appreciate that i i um i did look at a lot of basketball books um you know graphic novels there's one uh, called Slam Dunk, which is uh, a, a manga series really popular about a high school team in Japan going after the national championship. And, and the way they handle um, action in that, I, I found really inspiring. And, and in terms of the, the character designs, making sure that all the characters look distinct. I have to tell you, like, I was inspired by many of my cartooning heroes like Jeff Smith. So for instance, um, one of the things that most impresses me about Bone is that you know, the, the three bone cousins all essentially have the, are, are made up of the same brush strokes, right? But you're able to still make them distinct um, with, with like these really simple telltale features to the point where somebody else who's drawing them, who doesn't have the same style as you, will be able to draw them so that they're distinct. And, and I, I think about that kind of stuff a lot. Uh, so, so for for these characters, I wanted to make sure each of the high school kids on that team was was distinct. You know, exactly. Look at that. That that was it. It showed up right on the screen. How all three of the uh, of the bone characters of the bone oh. cousins are super distinct. <laughs> well, somewhere in the in the pictures jersey, I I there's a some there's a two page bit where Gene is talking to um, an I think an an Asian kid, an Indian kid with triangle hair. Can you see that? Tell me if it comes up on the screen. But this is a this is this is fascinating yep. to me because you're this is a this is a comic about you talking this is a comic about you talking to the students that you're going to make a graphic novel about. But it's also the graphic novel that we're looking at and this is this very um, Scott McLeod moment where the one kid, you know, he says, hey, I, you know, I know you're doing a graphic novel about me, but, you know, the way you're drawing my hair and he had like little points uh, and he was like, well, that's not how my hair looks. And then you go, well, let me let me see if I can work on it. And the next panel, his hair is changed and he's happy. With it. He's like, perfect. That was that kind of that was a that was a very cartoon logic, beautiful moment. Um, well, thanks. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> Scott McCloud is, is definitely one of my heroes. And that moment actually did happen in real life. You know, I was putting sketches of the uh, of, of the players up on Tumblr uh, as I was following them throughout the season. And, and Jeevan Sandu, um, the kid that you're talking about, he actually came up to me during practice one day. He's like, Mr. Yang, you're doing an awesome job, but I, I have some critiques about the way you drew my hairline. I didn't realize <laughs> before following this, this, uh, this team that... Um, Young, young athletic men care a lot about their hairline, <laughs> about how their hairline looks. 
they spent a lot of time on it. So I wanted to make sure to get to get but, that right. But not only did I think it was cool that you talked about, you know, a real life thing that happened about, you know, a discussion about the comic, but the fact that you chose to use comic magic and have click and you did it. I mean, that 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 was like uh I don't know. That was that was a that was a that was a kind of an up here level thing, I think. Um, well, thanks. Thank you. And plus, you talked about the fact that the reason why you did it that way, because you wanted to make sure it was clear that he was like a South Asian. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I thought that was yeah. uh, that was very cool. Yeah. Well, thanks, um, thanks. And then I and then um, yeah, I, we, well, you talked about uh, Coach Lou earlier, and I, I found this picture of you with the real Coach Lou, and. I was amazed. I think I found it on your Facebook page, um, but or maybe well, I don't remember where I found it. But it looks, and you're standing there with your backpack, and it looks like it could have been a shot out of the graphic novel. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Look at that nerdy backpack. Yeah, it, and uh, one one of the things that the coaches did um, complain about was that I drew them almost all the same height. And uh, and Dante, the other coach in that in that picture, is like way taller than Lou in real life. And he was like, "Why'd you draw me like Lou's height? I'm way taller than that guy." <laughs> that, that, yeah, that's fun. That's fun. So, um, you know, I don't think I didn't realize that you decided to go. I mean, I I know that you teaching is important to you. I know that, uh, but I I'm not quite sure. I know I have ever talked to you about why you went. And, took the job uh, at, at O'Dowd because it wasn't, um, you'd already done American Board Chinese by then. Is that right? Or is that- No, know? no, I actually, I did American Board Chinese about halfway through my career there. Uh, oh. So I began in 98 and you were around in 98 in, in, at the comic book sh uh, shows. Cause I would go and I would go and see you. I remember yeah. you had, that was, that was around the time that you had that giant like tree structure. With the, yeah, yeah. Remember that? That was, yeah, that was oh, amazing. Yeah. That I would yeah, always giant, find. Yeah, just giant, by looking home, for the giant tree structure. Home core, Stonehenge. Yeah, uh, it was gorgeous. It was gorgeous. And Charles Vest and Linda. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but I remember back then, the, the comic book industry was not doing very well, right? Like, like Marvel had just declared bankruptcy. And I didn't think that it was viable, for me at least, to have a a career in comics, you know? So I, I, my, my plan for my life at the time was I was gonna be a high school teacher full-time. I was gonna do comics on the side. Wow. That didn't turn out that, that was, that plan didn't work. That plan did not work. That plan, yeah, that plan changed. But I, I do think that, uh, I mean, one of the reasons why it changed was because comics itself changed so much, yeah. right? Like, like uh, in the late nineties, I think you were one of the few people that was able to do a successful book that was not about superheroes. And, and that's what I wanted to do at the beginning of my career. I did not want to tell superhero stories. And I just felt like, you know, I, I just felt like the, the success stories, it was like you and Linda Medley. I don't, I don't there's, there, there's a barely a handful of, of you guys that were able to do it. I just didn't feel like it was a, it was a viable option. But then things changed. I, I mean, um, graphic novels became a big thing. I think Craig Thompson's Blankets was a big deal. I think you and, uh, and, and graphics at Scholastic was a really big deal. And, and suddenly, this yeah, whole I market remember, opened uh, up. I remember uh, Chris Ware's uh, Jimmy Corrigan was a big deal. Yeah, that's right. That started that's pushing right. some doors open in, uh, in like the literary uh, circles, you know what I mean? Yeah, like uh, yeah. that. That's yeah. where like the New Yorker start or the New York Times or something. And then, yeah, then those of us at Scholastic were like kind of getting into the mainstream bookstores, and it was uh -huh. all happening. Uh, yeah. yeah, it was all of a sudden it was okay to like not do a superhero comic. And then, um, yeah, well, let me see here. Um, before we go talk about American Born Chinese, because I'm sure you talk about that all the time. And I do want to talk to you about it, but I'm but I'm going to come at you in a more like a cartoony chops decision kind of angle. Uh, uh, oh, but while you were teaching, well, I found this. I, this is a series of yours I did not know about. Secret decoders. Now that I assume is some grew out of your uh, it did high school teaching and all that. Yeah, so I, I was a computer science teacher for 17 years. So I taught a little bit of math and a little bit of art, but most of uh, my classroom time was spent in the computer lab. 
Uh, and I would teach in this really visual way. So I'd end up doing a lot of drawings on, on the whiteboard. And I always thought, man, a lot of this stuff would work really well in graphic novel format. So that's what Secret Coders is. It's me taking my lessons and kind of embedding them into a story. Uh, and I'm aiming them at, uh, at middle grade kids. I, I learned how to code myself as a uh, fifth grader. Wow. So I wanted to aim it at fifth graders. You know, I, I grew up in the Silicon Valley, like not not that far from the Apple offices. So I remember like um, the the moms and the dads of my classmates who were working at Apple before Apple was like what it is today would come into our class and talk to us about that kind of stuff. Wow. So I was just around. So talk, well, talk a little bit life. about the characters you put in there, like these little, they were very, very well designed, I thought. Yeah, well, well, I mean, part of that is because I got to work with an awesome cartoonist. So, you know, when I started uh, on Secret Coders, when I first proposed it, I was planning on drawing it myself. But then I began um, Dragon Hoops at around the same time. So I ended up drawing Dragon Hoops. And uh, for a second, my publisher suggested that I find somebody else to work with. I ended up uh, partnering with a guy named Mike Holmes. Have you read his stuff? I've it's, heard his uh, name, but I'm not sure. Yeah, he does. Uh, he does the Wings of Fire graphic novels. Are those, those Scholastic books? You know, you know those ones, the Wings I of Fire. Know. Okay, okay, but it's like it's like this the series about dragons that's super popular right now with with kids. But he's he's amazing. Like Mike is, um, uh, like one of those chameleon cartoonists who can kind of switch styles, you know, and uh, and then we worked together on the on the character designs, and he was the one that drew all six of the books. But it was it was a ton of fun. It was a ton of fun to do. So we had these characters that kind of embody different um, computer science concepts. So like we have these birds called binary birds that use their eyes to communicate in binary numbers. That's yeah, I'm, pull, I'm pulling up some pictures of the stuff. I definitely know. I've seen the stuff before. Yeah, yeah, that's very cool. Yeah, he's a he's a really talented guy. Super super fast too. One of the fastest cartoonists I know. Ooh, I like that. Yeah, I'm one, well, I'm one of the you, slowest. I don't know about you. I no, I don't, I don't believe that for a second because I feel like. Um, one one of the like I feel like anybody who comes in from animation comes into comics from animation is usually like super fast right and that was your background you you began as an animator yeah I mean I was more interested in comic strips and comic books but while I was trying to get into the biz I, I started up an animation company and did it for like eight or nine years and yeah if you draw a thousand pictures you do get a little better and a little faster and, and you learn to economize your drawings for sure did you guys uh, do your own in betweening in that in that? Yeah, uh, yeah. There was there were three three partners and two. Uh, we had our two like first like our in betweeners, but they actually very quickly became directors and and started out you know storyboarding and doing everything. But yeah, we had we did a lot. We just spread it around, and we were a small group. As we got bigger, you know, you had to hire more people and stuff like that. And yeah. Eventually, we were doing Hollywood little pieces of Hollywood movies. We did. Ba we worked on Baby's Kids. I, I, I saw Baby's Kids. I, I watched it recently, and I couldn't remember what, what we did on it. But it was most of the stuff in the amuse in the amusement park. Okay. Like where okay. they're like, here's some cre here's some lotion for your ashy ankles. <laughs> that was the stuff <laughs> we did. Or when they were doing the dozens, they're like going, "Your yeah. mama's so dumb. Somebody told her it was chilly outside. She wouldn't got a bowl." <laughs> we animated all that stuff. Okay. Uh, all, all right. Let's 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 hit uh, American board Chinese. Uh, it, this is an amazing book, and when I reread it for this interview, I was really struck by what a good cartoonist you are, Gene. I mean, really good, and I mean, because your your style covers multiple kinds of animation, multiple genres. Um, and storytelling wise, you were able to do something. And I, I forgot how much I didn't remember how the story ends. And we, just a warning, we may have some spoilers. I'm going to try not to, but it's hard to talk about how good this book is without talking about what happens at the end. But what we're going to try. So, um, Jersey, if we could see like the first few slides where we see uh, the first one is uh, the Monkey King, it's a little red version of him. Uh, this character uh, is, is obviously a mythological character. 
Uh, and you draw them so well, man. And uh, the, first, the first thing we see is like a big party being thrown by the gods. Great designs, awesome. How many of those are real Chinese gods? Or you just they are, they are all, all the ones in the, in the front are some of the ones in the back. I just made up, but all, <laughs> okay. all the ones in the front, like, what about the, uh, what about the war guy? He's like a big bird. Yeah. That's a, that's a real Chinese guy. I knew yeah. it. I knew, I, I just knew <laughs> you would do a real, you would do that. Cause I, I, that's kind of how I would do it. You would go get the real things and then design them. And they're all designed just solid. They're really good. Um, well, it turns out that the Monkey King wants to go to the party uh, and he's very excited. He has to wait in line and he's trying to get in. And there's this page where he's trying to get in. He's waiting in line, he's super excited. He snaps his fingers, he's like, I'm next, I'm next. And then they stop him, they won't let him in because he's a monkey. Even though he's a god, he's just a monkey. Uh, but the excitement of, of him coming into the room and then just his face when they stop him. Uh, and then, and then I, I can't remember what the next page is. I don't know if, what we have on there. Is he, is it where he's like beating them up? Yeah, yeah, it's where okay. he's beating them up. So I, I just skipped ahead here. But he's a, yeah, the, the monkey's like, you you know, you can't keep me out of here. And he's an excellent Kung Fu master. He's a, he's a god. And he just, just lays waste to him. He destroys them all. Uh, but then there's the last little picture in the sequence I chose was him going back home, descending down on his cloud. And the, there's elements of this, these drawings that just, just, I love them, especially panel one. He's floating in the cloud, going back down. It's night. His head is black. The sky is black. And all you really see are his ears and the stars, but you know where his head is. It's just, it's just tight, man. It's really tight cartooning. And him, every panel on that page of him going into the room, and he's, I mean, he was successful in beating up all the gods, but he's sad and he's feeling the, 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 the darkness. That's, that's what's left of his, his life. And it even says the line about he, he walks in and he gets hit in the face with the smell of monkey fur and he'd never noticed that before. And, but all the drawings completely communicate that. It's just I, I, very good. Man. Well, thank um, you. Thank the next you. story, the next story, the little red face of the boy, Jin Wang, uh, definitely strikes me as a little Jin Yang. <laughs> uh, I don't know about his best friend. Uh, how, how do you pronounce it? Wei Shen Sung? Wei Shen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Wei Chen. Yeah, yeah. Wei Chen, okay. Um, but the picture, the picture I chose here, uh, and this is not me asking questions, this is me just gushing on your artwork, okay? Uh, so this, this page is of him, there's uh, a, a girl in his class, they're, they're young, they're probably fifth grade, I'm guessing. Uh, but she's like hot and she takes her sweater off. And so here's this, here's this young boy just seeing a, a girl's shoulder just bared to him. Not a big deal, but he's so excited that his hair actually like whoosh, you know, goes up like in a Miyazaki cartoon or something. And that that rang true to me, man. That really rang true to me. Um, did that did you did that happen to you? Was there a real girl who was, took her sweater off and you went, ah? Oh. Yeah, yeah. Her. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean in junior high, I feel like I had I had like a different crush every week or something. So absolutely. And I was always too shy to talk to the girls. So uh, that was, you know, like a typical, typical comics nerd. Too shy well, to talk I can, to girls. Yeah, I can relate to that. I, I definitely had a crush on every single girl in elementary school and probably yeah. middle school and high school as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, that's kind of what Bone is. Bone is, yeah, Bone is that's the right. story of an unrequited crush. Um, that's right. But, that's but it eventually thing. worked out for you. It, it totally yeah, worked that, out for you at the end. That worked out too, um, <laughs> but you know that is there's. Yeah, but th thank you for that. Thank you for the thoughtful uh, analysis. It's really, uh, it, it, I think, it's really meaningful to hear hear all, all those words coming from you. You know, all like right. let's, no let's joke. I at, always say that you're one of my biggest influences. Oh, you say that to all the cartoonists. <laughs> let's look at let's look at this next picture, which is uh, this this old lady. Uh, where you were, or not you, I'm sorry, uh, Yin Wang was, Jin Yang was uh, waiting for his mom while she was at the apothecary and, uh, or the herbalist. 
and this there's this this is a very crucial moment in the story. Um, do you want to explain what's happening here? And I kind of want to ask you about your choice of the angles afterwards. Yeah, it's it's him sitting in uh, an herbalist shop, which is actually something I did when I was a kid. Um, we lived in San Jose, and we would drive an hour up to San Francisco almost every weekend to to visit a, a Chinese doctor and an herbalist, and we'd bring all this Chinese medicine back home. So it was just, you know, the the way I drew that shop was how I remembered that shop. Um, I, I even, I think I even went to San Francisco to that shop where we used to go when I was a kid and, and took some reference photos, but in this scene, um, he is watching the herbalist calculate bills on her abacus. Uh, and then, uh, they have this conversation about, you know, what it means to, to lose your soul. <laughs> so that part, that part actually wasn't real. I, I had some conversations with the, with the herbalist wife, but, uh, um, they weren't about losing your soul. They were just okay. You know, you're, small you're, talk. You're allowed. You're allowed to make up <laughs> fictional details for your story. Yeah. I I I know. I like the detail of the um, red and black enamel bench. That's that that got me there. I I was in the room where I could see where you were. Were you still in Chinatown? I think. But anyway, it was a Chinese herbalist. Uh, but what but what I liked about that last panel was for two pages or whatever it was. Um, it was more, it was more like regular two shots or medium shots, not the low angle you end with. And I just thought that that, this very important moment in story, you don't know it's that important until later, but she says this and it has a kind of a spooky effect on them. But all of a sudden we go down to his angle and we're like looking up and we see the, we see the room in this, you know, all these strange mysterious drawers and we're down in his kind of vulnerable, uh, smaller perspective. Uh, and I thought that was, I was, I liked it. I, I, I was like, I, this is a, this is a big moment. And that angle told me that. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I want, I wanted to emphasize that the, um, the, the words that she had just said had some sort of authority over him, right? Like it would, it would play into his life. Yeah. Like, and that last picture, that she's on. like all of a sudden up on like a judge's, yeah. yeah, very cool. All right, and then now the third character of American Board Chinese is yeah, rough. the most She's difficult rough. for sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah. in fact, I when I read the book even the second time, I didn't quite catch this until I was writing down my notes that his name is Ching Yeah, I, I was like I was like I was like Ching yeah. and I was reading, I was like, ah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, he's purposely rough. Purposely rough. Yeah, no, and I, I, you, yeah. Go, well, talk about him for a second, if you. Want to do. You know, I, I, um. So <laughs> the, he, he definitely is the most controversial part of the book. You know, right before, uh, it was published. First, second books. My publisher sent out review copies to different independent bookstores, and there were a couple of Asian American owned bookstores that flipped through the book and saw that character and didn't want to carry the book. You know, and, and we ended up having to convince them to actually read the book before they decided. And, and now now they're supportive. But um, I, I think he's purposely provocative. Like the way I thought of him is this. I thought of him as like a, a ghost that had kind of haunted me since I was a little kid. He was like all the stuff that um, that I was, I was afraid of, you know, and, and I put him into a character. And, and I did it because by the end of the story, I wanted to take off his head to kind of make them less scary to myself. Well, you, you nailed that. I mean, cause he is, well, I mean, well, I want to say this about that character. That is one of, that is a beautifully drawn character. I mean, that is a style of cartooning, a very, I mean, it has construction and appeal uh, that is reminiscent of like fifties animation. Uh, and not a lot of people can pull that off. It's one of my areas that I really enjoy. So I really, I was very impressed by that. Um, I mean, but you don't let anybody like him even for a second. I mean, he's, he's horrible immediately. He's every wicked, horrid stereo, ugly stereotype that could possibly be there. Um, and I, I think you made the right call. It, it pays off correctly in the end you used him correctly but before we talk about that 
uh, I want to ask you about your decision to make that part of the book. And if you haven't read American Born Chinese, why not? Uh, but also it's, it's sort of like these three characters, their chapters alternate. So uh, we get to uh, Ching Ki's chapter and suddenly we have either like a cheesy, tasteless 70s, 80s laugh track. It's a sitcom. What in the world were you thinking? How did you come to that? I, I, I don't, I. Yeah, I, um, you know, part of it is that um, it's just a dynamic that I've, I've noticed in my family and, and maybe in the Chinese immigrant community in general. Like uh, a lot of times, I saw this with my cousins, you know, um, they came uh, when they were a little bit older and the way they got to know American culture was through sitcoms. You know, they would watch like Family Matters and, and Growing Pains and all, all that kind of stuff. And, and to them, that was like quintessential America. That was like what you wanted to be. So I wanted that element in, the, in, in my graphic novel. You know, so it's, it's this ugly Chinese stereotype coming into a quote unquote quintessential America. But it's like a really shallow version, right? It's a really, really shallow version of what America is, is supposed I, to be. I think a lot of those shows were pretty shallow. There's still yeah. a lot of them are pretty shallow. <laughs> not all of them, but a lot not of all of them. them. Not all of them. Absolutely. And the way yeah. you and the way you uh, portrayed it with uh, the laugh track just running across the bottom every time you said anything. That's exactly how those sitcoms were. Yeah. And they were tasteless and shallow. I think they were. I, I again I I, I was really blown away by that, that choice. Um, uh, so, okay, I, di I do think you use that character correctly. And that was, I think it was a dangerous thing to do, uh, but I think you pulled it off. And congratulations, because <laughs> artistic choices like that are, are, are scary. They are very scary and I'm, very proud of you for doing that. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, I do think about that a lot, right? Because when I did American Born Chinese, I was self-publishing. So uh, not even self-publishing. I was Xeroxing. I was Xeroxing and stapling and selling copies at Ape. Uh, no so, kidding. Yeah, yeah. And, and it wasn't until after I finished the, it's nine chapters long. I finished the eighth one like that, that I, I finally um, got connected to, to first. Oh second my release. gosh. So, so when was that? What year was this? That was I mean, late to mid nineties. Yeah, no, I, yeah, I began, I think I began in 2000, maybe, okay. maybe in, at the end of 99, somewhere around there. Right. Uh, and, and then I was just doing it, you know, I was just doing it a, a chapter at a time um, as these little mini comics, say, hand stapled mini comics. Uh, and then, and then uh, towards the end of that, like I think 2000, 2004, 2005, I got hooked up with for a second. So I, I do think about how, if I had known that it end up in a graphic novel, I wonder if I would have made those same choices. Because when, when you're working on that level where, you know, you're selling like 16 copies of every issue, you know, <laughs> most of the people that are reading it, right? It's like all my cartoonist friends and maybe my mom. <laughs> yeah. That's fantastic. Very cool. Uh, so uh, as I, well, one thing I noticed uh, this time as I was reading it, but as opposed to the first time, is that um, you made this uh, unusual choice. M maybe this is because it came from a mini comic. I don't know, but you, the page is square mm -hmm, mm -hmm. instead of you know a rectangle, an upright rectangle. Is that because you were doing mini comics? Yeah, yeah. It was it was because I was doing mini comics. I, uh, I actually you, wanted it to like. There's a comic book store um, in Berkeley that used to be in Berkeley called Comic Relief, and they had a I shelf full it. of these Rory Root. Comics. Yeah. yeah, Rory Root. Yeah, I th I think did you do a signing? there once oh yeah i did many signings at roy root yeah I, he and i were pretty tight and yeah we i think there. i think i went to one of your signings at at uh at comic relief but yeah. he had he had a shelf full of of mini comics oh and, yeah a giant a giant yeah yeah he was he was totally he was such a supporter of that but i wanted i wanted the book to stand out in, on, on that shelf and i thought making it square would make it look a little bit different from everything well, else you show. ended up uh, as a design element in order to fill the page. You put this little, like, looked like a, like a Chinese little stamp, yeah, red stamp at the top. And this time on the way through, I noticed that uh, the Monkey King had the same stamp all the way through. And then the stamp changed when you got to the boy, and then when you uh -huh. got to uh, Ching He, it was another stamp. That's right. And then I noticed 
that in the climax of the story, it had been one stamp for a while. And right on one page, it switches to another stamp because yeah. a change has happened in the character. Right? A, a climax has been reached. Has, yeah, have people, yeah. have people have caught that, right? I didn't. Uh, yeah, so, some people have. Some people have. I, I, again, I'm like, I'm kind of shocked that that Jeff Smith is reading my comics with such care. It's uh, oh, God, God. this is such a, this is such a. It's like, a, like if he had told me when I was in my 20s, he would have freaked out. Like 20 year old <laughs> Gene Yang would have freaked out about this moment. Uh, Dude, but, I'm freaking out. I'm freaking out. I'm, t- I'm talking to you. You're a freaking <laughs> MacArthur genius, Grant. Come on. Well, and it's, thanks, and it, but... I believe it's deserved. Okay, so uh, let's see. Where are we here? On my little plan here. Oh, oh, there's one last thing. I got to I gotta point out how a cool thing is in Jersey. This is where there's two panels where he kind of explodes out of the panel at the end. It's two pages. And the first page is... The monkey god who's kind of gotten very full of himself and he meets like uh, uh what's his name Dr- yeah it's a zi, zi yuzi, yeah it's a zi he's yuzi, like a chinese who's sort yeah, of yeah. like he's like the over god he is he's of yeah. uh, this uh pantheon and the monkey god is not impressed he's full of himself and he's like you can't lay a hand on me and then he flies off on his little cloud and the the hand just comes after him but on the second page he literally goes beyond the boundaries of reality and breaks out of the comic book panel. Game, <laughs> set, match. You did it. You did it. That is okay, okay. That is perfect. <laughs> Again, I, I, thank you. Thank you. I am not a big fan of breaking the fourth wall, but when you when you go all Scott McCloud, Chris Ware formalism, you and it, and you just make me laugh and smile. And you did it. You did it. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, I, I, I think, I feel like, um, you know, I was working, when I was working on American Born Chinese, I was part of this uh, Bay Area community. Like, I don't know how, uh, I guess you you made the, like, more of a direct jump from, I guess it wasn't direct, but it was a jump from animation to uh, to comics, right? Did you have a community around you when you did that? Were there other no, people? No, no, just, it was just, you, you did it. Yeah. On your own. Just the J and I. I, and yeah. I, I, I had a, you know, I had my friends and my partners and my co-workers at the animation studio. Uh, but I wanted to, we were mostly doing commercials and I just was not, that was not doing yeah. it for me. Yeah. So I wanted to you, do it. Because you wanted to tell phone. stories. Yeah. yeah. I wanted to tell stories about phone bone mostly. Yeah. And um, I just, somewhere in there, I discovered the, you know, the independent comic book stores and the independent comics. And uh, so it was just really Vijaya and I, uh, her helping me figure out the plan to do it. Uh, and it was really just us pretty much. Yeah. We didn't, I, wow. I met and made a new, friends and made a new community as I got into comics, uh, you know, with comics critics and reviewers and retailers mm-hmm. and other cartoonists, obviously. Um, I mean, I, I, when I met my heroes, I got all crazy, you know. And Frank Miller met me in a bar in like Oakland somewhere for WonderCon and slapped me on the back and said, Welcome to comics, kid. And I'm like, oh, dang. <laughs> uh, but yeah, but, awesome. uh, but, but I made it, I made a community in comics. And then I sort of made a second community with uh, I started with the flight group. I think <laughs> Scott McLeod, who I was pretty tight with in the early days. He introduced me to the flight group, and I, I think I kind of met you through that, but I'm not 100. Yeah, sure. yeah, because so because some of some of the folks that I I kind of came up with like Derek Kirk Kim and Lark Pian, they had done some stuff for with Kazu for flight. Oh, and, uh, and, and Kazu and I were were kind of kind of friends. Yeah, 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 all the way through. I mean, it's it was that was a that was kind of a I I think of that as like my art school, right? I I never went to art school, but what I did was I hung out with. Derek and there's a guy named Jesse Ham and um, and Jason Shiga. Uh, we were all these Barry cartoonists that we would hang out once a week at somebody's house and, and look over each other's pages. Fair. So a, a lot of American born Chinese was done like that, you know, like uh, a lot of it was like kind of me just trying to impress my friends. So I would do a page, I'd bring it to, to, to the was it, was it, was it, was it like a, a frying pan thing? <laughs> you know, the frying pan? Uh uh-uh. what's the what's the, the frying pan, pan was it was Scott McLeod's like uh not a, not like a community that all lived in the same city but uh 
you know, he had his, his buddies, they would all like pass around like mini comics and they called it the frying pan. Um, it was, was, it sounds exactly like that. Yeah. And, and, it it exactly was, like and, that. and it's, it was Scott. So it was crazy. Uh, oh, you can see my dog coming down the stairs yeah. the back there. Uh, Oh, well, look, dude, I could talk to you all freaking night and I have so many th things I am not going to get to, but we have to, I, I really want to cover a couple of other things like uh, Superman smashes the plan. What a brilliant idea. What? what how, okay, I tell the story of that. Where, how, did they call you or? Well, it's, uh, I, I mean, um, it's, it, it began as a conversation. It was a, it was a conversation between me and Marie Javins, who is now the editor-in-chief, a co-editor-in-chief at, at DC Comics. Um, but she was uh, at Marvel for a really long time and switched over. And we, we met at the beginning like a, a, of, a, of a convention. I think we had breakfast at a, at a, like, I think it was a book convention. I don't think it was a comic book convention. And she told me that uh, DC was looking to start a middle grade YA line of comics. You know, um, and, and honestly, I think that like you were there maybe like 10 years too early with the Shazam book, <laughs> but that like that kind of book, the kind of book that you did with Shazam, they wanted to do a whole line uh, of comics. Oh, it's more like Marvel did that, the ultimate series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Marvel did the ultimates, but what, what they wanted was um, with uh, with the DC line was a, a wider um are like a style a, a wider variety of art styles so the, they would want like comics that were drawn superhero comics that were not drawn the way traditional superhero comics were drawn so i talked to them about it they asked me to pitch i and i pitched them superman smashes the clan which is actually uh uh it's an adaptation of this really old Superman story from way back in 1946 on his yeah, radio, radio show. show. Yeah, which is really crazy. Introduced kryptonite. Yeah, that's right. That's right. The radio show introduced kryptonite, introduced uh, like uh, Perry White, all these elements. Um, but in 1946, Superman actually took on the Klan uh, in in his radio show, and he did it to defend a Chinese American family. Mm. I I learned about this years ago, and it always intrigued me. So when the opportunity came up to actually adapt it to comics, I, I jumped at the chance. Yeah, I was, uh, I mean, I knew about that show and I, I used to, I mean, I've always been interested in like the old serials and the radio shows and stuff. But I, but, but I was surprised when I uh, read sort of the back material in, in the book that the, in the radio show, it was against a Chinese family. Yeah. And not a black family. I just kind of assumed you might've changed that uh, just to make it more, I know authentic or something, but no, yeah, that's yeah, what the no, original radio show was. That's what I thought was, was one of the most intriguing parts of it too. And, and I feel like that's something that I really learned about um, by, by doing that book. Cause I thought it was, it's a non, it's a non uh, obvious choice, right. To, to have at the center of a story about the clan, a, a Chinese American family. So I, I wanted to figure out why they made that choice. And I think there are lots of reasons for it. Um, some of them, are, are are better than others. Well, so, it, brings it, it, it brings it forward into today today's discussions about immigrants. Immigrants. It does instead of just you know one race or something. It's it was it was a pretty broad kind of a hate. Yeah, yeah. It was it was definitely a broad hate. They um, so I, th I think one of the reasons why they chose to make it a Chinese American family is because historically. The Klan was not a fan of of, uh, of Chinese immigrants, right? So the Klan began in the South as a movement against African-Americans. But pretty quickly after that, there was a clan of the West that was established that was primarily targeting Chinese immigrants. So that was like in the late 1800s. But I, I do think that the main reason why it's a Chinese American family is not a, it's not an awesome reason. It's, it's because um, at the end of World War II, um, Chinese immigrants, or I'm sorry, not Chinese immigrants, Chinese American uh, veterans were allow, uh, allowed to move into predominantly white suburbs. Uh, uh, and and the, they were allowed because China was an ally of America during the war. But then African-American families by and large were not allowed to make that same move, you know? So it's, uh, it's like a, a level of, of racism behind that, even that decision to, to have it be a Chinese American family. Uh, that's awesome. 
All right, now I have to make some, I think we're getting close on to our time frame. And I want to tell uh, people who are watching this, um, uh, that, okay, you've done a lot. Okay, I, I, okay, I, wanna, I just want to jump to Shang, to Shang-Chi is what I'm trying to get to. Uh, forget what I said about people watching this. Um, what, okay, so has that happened yet or is that just something you're working on? It's it the first issue will be out in September. Okay, so uh, it hasn't come out yet because I couldn't find anything about it except for a couple of really cool drawings by uh, yeah, somebody. yeah. The, the one that's up on the screen right now is by uh Jimmy Chung, who's amazing. He he he's probably best known for a run on uh Young Avengers that he did a while ago, but he's he's one of the best. And you put a lot of time in on Avatar, I did not know that. Yeah, yeah. I was uh, I was shocked that I got the opportunity to do that. Um, Avatar is one of the best animated shows that has ever aired on American television. I, I would argue the best. Uh, well, I remember but, a lot of the the flight people. Yeah, right. It. And, and a lot of them worked on it. And so, and, uh -huh. didn't you, and, didn't, and Faith Aaron Hicks was working on that comic as well. He, yeah, she she's doing it right now. So I did the first five, and then. Uh, she did six, seven, and I think she's working on on eight as well. She's so, one. She's one of my favorite. She's so good. Cartier she's so good. good. Yeah, she's very good. Every time uh, I read then, one of her, her comics, I feel like I learned something. Okay, we're gonna. I gotta do this one. A couple last thing here. The terrifics. Uh, I I have a couple pictures up here. I don't know which one's gonna be up first, but it's the. I think it's just the cover of twenty five, which has got a lot of heroes on it. Uh, that looks like a very fun comic. Are you having a good time on that? It, yeah, it was fun. It, it just ended. Like, I think this month was was the last issue. But uh, the Terrifics began as almost like a spoof of uh, Fantastic Four. It's four heroes in the DC universe rather than the Marvel universe. The leader's a, a, a super genius. And then there's a guy who looks like he's made out of rocks. And then there's a, a, a girl who can um, go through walls. You know, and like, did like you make up the woman. name, the Terrifics? No, no. It was Jeff Lemire. Who is oh, one of my favorites? Yeah, you yeah. Took that from him, right? Yeah, wow. that's right. Here, Gene Yang, Faith Aaron Hicks. That's, yeah. that's got some. That's got some heavy <laughs> lineage there, man. Yeah, it's uh, it was fun to do. It was fun to do. I mean, I mean, it really is about the future. That book is about the future. Uh, it's about this this black genius, like a you know African American nerd pushing towards the future, and it was super fun. It made me miss uh, black nerd leaders. That's what it made yeah. me miss. <laughs> well, that's wonderful. Well, Gene, thank you so much for doing this and coming and, and being our keynote to uh, really lift off uh, CXC 2020. Uh, oh, it's it's my pleasure. Thank you for thank you for thinking of me. Thank you for for everything. It's been great. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye.